Thank you. When we look around, we see those who come that, that hadn't been here, and we find different ones. But Ruth Goodwin, I know you're back there. Thank you for being here, for you and your family, your husband, and God bless you all. Thank you for being here. And I, I don't like to do this, but I uh, did get a, a check on this. They gave me one thing and then brought another one to me by, by this, uh, the Tammy Poquette situation. The, the mother, the mother died, or the, the aunt died. Uh, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't say welcome to Robin, who had a real tremendous experience this week. And Robin Tart is here today. He's going through much sickness, and, and we welcome you here, Robin. I see you there. Now, at the end, we have the offering, and I want to close with a song, and I'll tell you what it is in just a little while, okay? Uh, but I want to close with it with just singing and praising the Lord. And I want to tell you that next week we will not meet here. We will meet over in the trees. You bring your lawn chair. You're going to hear some good old-fashioned great singing outside. And um, we're going to have dinner on the ground. And we're going to have a time for you. And folks need to get out and come and it'll be free flowing and we hope the weather's good and we're just believing for that and we're going to have a great service where we pray and we preach and we or we, we sing and shout and, and won't preach but uh, close the service out with a prayer for the sick, for the healing, healing. It's going to be a great time and everybody said amen. Now I want to give you the, the gist behind what I'm going to say today. And I, you're going to understand some of it because you have heard it, okay? But I want you to hear it and I want you to know it. And, I, and some will be recapitulation and some will be capitulation. So whatever those mean, here they go. Revelation is going to be revelation. And then the first one I'm going to read to you is going to be from uh, the book of uh, John, 1 John chapter 2 and 18. Dear children, this is his prophecy. You can argue with this, not me. Dear children, the last hour is here. Now that song said the time is coming when you're Jesus you'll see. I want you to say with me, the last hour is here. And he says, you'll know it because Antichrist is coming. He doesn't say may come, but I want you to say it with me. Antichrist is coming. And he says, already such forerunners, the spirit of Antichrist, just the spirit of it, is already here, has appeared. And from this we know, he says again, for emphasis, that the last hour has come. And Revelation, the, the turning point here is going to be Revelation chapter 4, in verse 1, where it says, Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I heard, that's about all the seven churches and the candlesticks and all of that, you never hear those anymore after this verse. It's the dividing verse. And I heard that same voice that spoke before me say, it sounded like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. 
They are in red. They are the words of Christ. You'll see it in a good Bible. And what it is, is this is the point where the rapture has come and we all go to heaven who are ready, okay? You can be seated. Thank you very much. There is coming a day. There is coming a day. It's not here yet. And we are thankful that it isn't here today because if it was, we'd be in a mess, wouldn't we? We'd be left behind. Every blood-bought, blood-washed saint of God will be taken from this earth to heaven. I don't know how it will happen. I have no way of knowing. Nobody knows it. To defy all of gravity, to defy everything, it will happen. Denominations will have nothing to do with it. You'd say, well, I want to go as a Baptist. You'll go as a forgiven sinner. Race, creed, color, social standard, no position whatsoever you've had on this earth will have anything to do with your going in the rapture. Those who will be evacuated will be those who have believed simply that the Lord Jesus Christ came to this world. Here are the prerequisites. That he came to this world. That he stayed 33 years and ministered that he died on the cross of Calvary at Golgotha and that he was buried in a borrowed tomb and he was raised from the dead and he went to heaven right out of the Mount of Olives and said, I'm coming back. Now, if you can embrace that, oh, not with your head, but with your heart, then you can go to heaven. I want to tell you how easy it is, but yet it's difficult. How many of you can honestly say today with me, I believe that with all, with all your heart. I believe that with all of my heart. Can I get a big amen? amen? That's probably everybody. But to believe it with your head and believe it with your heart is a, two different things. It's got to travel 16 inches here to your heart because the demons actually believe that. But they are going to spend their time in hell, not heaven. And I know of people who believe it in their head. They say, oh, I'm, I'm a Christian by head. You got to be a Christian by heart. How do you know that, Pastor? Because the word says, that if you believe in the righteousness of Christ, right here, that you are going to be saved. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, not confess everything you've ever done. We don't have enough time for that today for me. But if you confess the Lord Jesus, he is the son of God. And believe in your heart. This is what it says, Paul says, and the spirit says, Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you're going to be saved. I'm saved. Can you put your hand up and say it? I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. We make it so difficult sometimes to think that if you've been a Sunday school teacher for a long time or whatever, it's not true. It will be a day when dead bodies literally come out of Lafayette Cemetery and everywhere they are, Nobody knows how. The scripture says that dead, the sea gave up its dead. You'd say, well, it doesn't know where they were. They were eaten by whales or fish or whatever. The DNA is there. The spirit never forgets. And he will make a new body out of it. That day is coming. And they will go first. And then those who are left here on this earth will go up next. Those who are believers will go to heaven and be with the Lord. You'll be part of the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. You'll be part of the team that comes back to fight in the Battle of Armageddon. 
you've got something waiting and you're not going to lose. That's why I say to you today, take heart. Already in heaven, he has a party that he's getting together for the final fling. It's going to be a bang in heaven. I want you to know that. The whistles and the balloons and the royal table is getting ready for the rapture and the marriage of the saints. When the bridegroom steps out, Jesus Christ, and says, I want my bride to come home. And we are the bride of Christ. Immediately on this earth, there will be a time of tribulation. You can read from Daniel and he'll tell you how the 70 weeks play in and 69 of them, weeks of years, seven years, have already come and gone with everything that was prophesied except the last seven years. That is waiting and it's the next thing on the agenda after the rapture of the church. So I stop for a moment here and ask you, do you understand what I'm saying? If you do, I want a hearty amen. amen. I want to make sure that you understand it, or I'll start over again. Now, immediately at the time of this tribulation, what is going to happen on this earth? A lot of us, we don't preach it. We, we're afraid of it. The pastors and, are afraid of it. I've asked some of our own pastors, what do you know about this? They said, I don't know much about it. I, I just stick with uh, what makes you feel good and all this stuff like this. But look, I want to tell you what is going to happen. I'm urgently telling you what's going to happen. And I'm going to base it on the scripture. Immediately on this earth, this seven years is going to take place. It is called the tribulation. It is not the great tribulation. Don't let it fool you. Half of it will be tribulation, and the last half will be the great tribulation, the greater, meaning that it will intensify, and you, will, you won't, but the, it will be a tough time on this earth. For seven years, for the first three and a half, there will arrive from hell, I mean it, hell's Messiah. We're going to have hell's, they're going to have hell's Messiah coming to the earth. He will not look like a devil. He will not have a pitchfork and a red suit on. He will be cunning, hypocritical, slick, political, religious, social, persuasive, speaker, singer, everything that you can think of, he is going to be Mr. It. And at that time on this earth, they're going to need somebody to take over. You say, well, it's just that the saints are gone, but do you realize what's going to happen at that time? You talk about economy and Wall Street and anything else. Let me give you just a little bit that I see that's going to happen. When the rapture comes in this air, there are hundreds and thousands of airplanes around the world. Some of those pilots are born again believers. If they are raptured, somebody has got to pilot the ship. And with that many planes crashing, there are going to be a lot of dead bodies and carnage left in this world. And just to pick up those things that happen in the air is going to be a gargantuan job to do. Those that are on the earth, when cars hit each other, when we see somebody in the, in the home saying, we can't make it anymore. Mama's gone. Daddy's gone. We don't know what we're going to do. Now, you can take a chance on it if you'd like, but I'm not going to take any chance. You say, but what if you're wrong? I send it right back to you and say, what if you're wrong? You'd say, well, I believe that I can study my, my religions from the Far East. 
Buddha is still in the tomb. Muhammad is still in the tomb. Confucius still in tomb. Stalin is still lying there for people to come by and look at him. And Lenin is still lying there in state. People can come by and watch him and see him. But the Jerusalem grave where Jesus lay is empty. He is the only one that's ever done it. And he never rotted away. You can say, well, I don't, I don't know about that. Well, take your chances. I would not miss it, would you? Now that's, I'm, I don't want to give you anything else on that for that part. That's going to be bad enough. But then the thing that will happen on this earth, according to the scripture, when this man begins to take over politically and, and spiritually, those two things seem to go together. You've seen that before. And some have thought that this man was the Pope. Some have thought that it was a president or an emperor or a leader like Hitler or Mussolini or somebody like that. It wasn't any of them. They are going to be a drop in the bucket compared to this man. A William Jennings Bryan with a silver-tongued oratorical ability will be a drip, a spot compared to what this man can do with his persuasive, hypocritical theology and sociology and his religiosity. He will put them into one and it will be a tough time for this earth. At that time on this earth, Jesus said, there will be distress of nations. I quote him with perplexity. You, you, you don't use perplex anymore, do you? It means boxed in, no way out. Right, left, back, front, up, down, no way out. And folks are going to say, we don't care who he is. As I read to you that quote in one of the messages three or four weeks ago, it doesn't matter, they said, who he is, let him come and we will take him as our leader. He will be a living man. And during this time, God's work will begin on this earth. Still God's work. And at that time, one third of the trees and vegetation will be lost according to the vials and according to the bowls and according to the vessels and the, and the horses in Revelation. I can't tell you all of it today. One third, everybody say it, one third. That means 33 out of 100%. If that were all, one third of the oceans will be poisoned. You love fish? No, some of you don't. But you're not gonna get any then because it's gonna be poisoned and the waters and the rivers. And one third of the people, according to the book of Revelation, you want the book, not me, will die in some way. These are some of the things that are going to happen. Folks will beg for somebody. We've got to have somebody. Please, you think you need somebody now? You don't know anything compared to what is going to happen if Jesus comes and this Antichrist comes and for three and a half years he will cunningly, he's a hypocrite, he will say one thing but be underneath he's something else. He's a little flower but he's the serpent up under that flower there. Jew. He looks one thing and he does another. Not the real thing, is he? When he comes in, in three and a half years exactly, he will have befriended the Jews and they will say, man, we didn't know that somebody could be this good. Let him in our pulpit. Let him in our temple. It will have been built by that time. And at that time, after three and a half years, he will turn, first of all, on the Jews. 
And if you think Antiochus Epiphanes was bad, when he shut off a group of people trying to get free and put them in a cave and set fire to it and killed them with smoke, or to, to shatter the Jewish belief, he went into the temple and took a hog and slew that hog on the altar that was so holy. Thousands and thousands of Jews died. It was one of the worst times in history and they did not repent. There will be signs in the earth and in the sky. There will be signs that any Christ himself will do because he will be empowered not by himself. As hell's Messiah, he will be empowered by the devil. Satan will empower him, Revelation says. Gives him the power. And he gives other power to the false prophet that rises out of the earth that I preached to you last and taught to you last week. In the message there, you can get it. This is just a slight recap for that. It's going to be a time when he does miracles. They'll say, well, we got to have somebody to take miracles, man. We got we to see some miracles. And this is the reason I ask you, be careful about how you go and follow after miracles and signs. Jesus said, in an evil and an adulterous nation, people search for a sign, always a sign. Now, I've sought for a sign before. Still have that feeling that we need to trust God, what he's doing. When you start seeking for that and running from pillar to post, saying, I got to know what's new over here. I don't trust what you say. I want to get all this stuff. It looks fantastic. I beg you again, just be very careful about what you get. Because you will believe a lie and be damned. Or doomed, it says in the King James, to be damned. He will come in and he will say, all right, you want to buy and sell? I got a way to get you. You're going to have to take my mark. It's a mark of a man. It's a mark called 666. He will institute this ingenious mark of the beast. It will be more than a Barnum, P.T. Barnum hoax. He will contain and control the world with his mark, 666. It's the number of a man. He will control with the mark that will be on the, on the forehand, right here, or on the forehead, on the right hand, or on the head, right here. It will not be any of this thing, let me have your card, punch it in. And now my new card came in with, it's, I've had it for years, but I had to get another one because I punched it in so many times. It was dog earing on the side. And it said, no need to punch in anymore. I, I left my wallet, I'm sorry. I usually don't, but I did today. Just take your card and you've got it, haven't you? Look on the back and get that little sign there and just go up to the thing at Walmart or at Belk's or anywhere else and just touch it. And it's that fast. You don't have to plug it. You don't have to do it like this and put cellophane on if it won't work. Got it so fixed. You say, well, how is he going to do it? You can't have a computer big enough for the whole world. If somebody said it's already built, I did not say that. But I received that from some of my staff members who said it's already been built. I don't know. But I believe that they've got computers. Somebody said, well, I'm afraid of shots and inoculations. I'm not preaching about it today. Do what you want to. Because it's going, one man said in Raleigh, said, I don't want it because it's going to follow me. He said, they're trying to track me. I want to tell you, if you'll read Reader's Digest on the 
cell phone on that wonderful company that they call Google. Just go and everybody says, Google it. Everywhere I go, I took a picture of Bill Allen and Nancy at the Breakers in, in, down in Florida, where Trump is from. We were just standing there, and I took a picture. I didn't think a thing about it, chronicling it, telling where I was. Six months later, I looked at the picture I had on my, my I've still got it right here in my cell. And it says, same place that I was at, the city comes up. If I'm in Raleigh, it says Raleigh. If I'm in Clayton, it says Clayton. It follows where you go. And there is not much that they don't know about you and me. So don't think that you're going to let them follow you. They're already following you, and they know where you are. They do it at Walmart. They do it at the grocery store. They do it with the numbers. They do it with the check it in. They do it with this. Lay it on there so you can get a discount. They know how much, they know how many cans of beans you eat last week. Excuse me, eight. That many cans? <laughs> you consumed them. Now, it's already being done, and I shudder at it. When I think, when I read the articles on what is happening, and I can't get into that. I won't, because I want to get through. Now, it's his ingenious way of doing it, but it's already been set. It will look like the end for this earth because of the number of this man. But at this very moment, when it looks like the end has come, there is another number that comes, and it's not a six, because the number of a man is six. It is a number of an incompleteness. For there is something, as some of the theologians said, that we're never complete until we find God. I think it's every one of us that's waiting for the completion to come. And the completion of our number six, listen, is going to come when we become a number seven and we have God to come into our lives. And it's going to be the same way because we've got a number seven that runs all the way from Genesis to Revelation. For in the book of Genesis... He took seven days to make the world. He created seven notes for a musical scale. He created seven colors for a visible spectrum. He created the feast and said, let's have seven to Jehovah in Leviticus chapter 23. There are seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. I've preached on all of them. Father, forgive them. I thirst. All of those. At the fall of Jericho, seven priests marched in front of the army bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns. And on the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times and blew the horns and the walls fell. Joshua chapter 6. And we move to Revelation, for in the revelation of Jesus Christ, the number seven is used more than 50 times. There are seven churches, there are seven spirits, there are seven candlesticks, there are seven stars, there are seven lamps, there are seven seals, there are seven horns, there are seven eyes, there are seven trumpets, there are seven thunders, there are seven heads, there are seven crowns, there are seven angels, there are seven plagues, there are seven bowls, there are seven mountains, there are seven kings, there are seven beatitudes, there are seven years of judgment, there are seven letters to the church, the seven churches, there are seven I am statements of Christ, there are seven songs in the revelation. Six may be man's number, but it is not God's. God's is always seven. And when I asked Tony Gaffney why the boy sneezed in 2 Kings seven times, he said, John, it's a sign of completeness that God was raising the boy from the dead. I mean, perhaps the number of our, our, our human number may be in the sixes, but we are in the sevens. And one day, as they sang, there is coming a day when he's going to crown us with a, with a perfect seven, and we're going to reign with him. At number 666 reminds us something is missing about us and it's missing about you, my brother and sister, until you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. You just take heart. 
for the earth is not belonging to the beast and the days of this beast and this antichrist are numbered and the punishment is coming. We look like he's going to stay forever, but he's not. For Revelation 19 and 20 says, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worshipped, who worked the signs, and in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, that's the humans, and those who worshipped his image. Those two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And in spite of the power and the control of this false prophet that he will exercise during the tribulation, his doom is sealed. He will be cast, understand it, cast alive, look in your Bible, into the lake of fire. Those who take the mark of the beast will not fare much better, but they were forced to. It doesn't matter. You'll have a different thought about the vengeance and the, uh, and the um, ways of God and his thoughts on guilt and innocence when you go to heaven. It says, then the beast was captured and with him, the false prophet who worked signs in the presence by which he deceived those to receive they all were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Revelation 19, argue with him. I mean, this is what he says. I'm giving you the word. And I'm not cutting any corners, okay? In spite of the power and the control of this false prophet that he will exercise during this tribulation, his doom is going, it is already sealed, not going to be. He will be cast alive into the lake of fire and those who take the mark of the beast will not fare much better. Revelation 16, one and two says, listen to this one. A foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image and they're gonna be lost. Revelation 14, 10 through 11 says that they will drink of the wine of the wrath of God and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb forever and ever. It might appear that those who take this can say, well, it, we were forced to do it just to get food. It will not be that this time. The time will be up. They will not repent all the way down through that and they repented not. You'll see that recurring sign and they repented not, they would not repent. Now here's the end of them. I saw thrones and they sat up on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshiped the beast or his image. Those that loved not their life unto the death and had not received the mark, of the, the mark of the beast on the foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's Revelation 20 and 4. It looks like foolishness to the world to believe, and they say, you can't possibly believe that. That's what they're going to say, and that'll be over and over and over again, and they will not repent though these things happen before them. All a third of the land, a third of the waters, a third of the heavens, all of these will fall and they will not repent. This is what the word says. They fail to repent. Then the false prophet, I'm to the end almost. The false prophet will come with power and influence, deceiving many and causing widespread destruction through his plan of economic domination but his days are numbered too. While he may taste unlimited success at first, it's literally limited, and his success will be a counterfeit for the original. The prophet will be allowed to spread the evil during the tribulation, but God is merely biding his time. One day, justice will prevail and the prophet will meet his fiery end.
And the book of Revelation gives me a new, the last of the sevens, when it says, and they all said, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. How many are there? Seven. What do you do about giving the blessings and honor to God? You say, why don't you ask them out there? I'm asking you in the, in the audience today around the country in Fayetteville, you members who are at home today, I'm asking you, what do you do about your eternal salvation? You're careful, aren't you? to lay up for yourselves treasures that the moth will steal. But I urge you, I beg you and implore you, lay up something that nobody can take from you. One day, Jesus is coming. And I believe from everything that I can see, it's the next thing on the calendar. I'm waiting for that moment when I can take the trip to heaven. I mean, that man might have got on that spaceship this week and taken a few people, the oldest, the youngest, and all those people out to the outer space. That's just a beginning. How long will it take to get you to heaven? Here it is. The speed with God is the speed of a thought. I wanna show you how fast it goes. I want you to think something right now. I want you to think about a ship right now. Now I want you to think of an airplane. There's no second to it. There's no way to do it. It's going to be that fast, faster than that. In fact, Paul uses a term that is like the splitting of an atom when he comes. And that day that this choir sang about and you sang about at offering, coming that day, will be faster than the splitting of an atom. What is the speed of the splitting of an atom? It is the same word in the Greek there for the splitting of the atom. And it's in one, one hundredth, no, but one, one millionth of a second. I don't understand how it can happen. It's beyond me. I didn't study that. Maybe you understand it. What I want to do, now you got me rolling. I want to show you the greatest turnaround in all of history. You've seen the beast have his time and the prophet, false prophet have his time out of the 13th chapter. And I've shown you all the way up to these things that are gonna happen. Now I want to show you, I'm through with the bowls and the vials and the wrath and all of that. I want to show you what it's gonna be like when we all get to heaven. And I wanna show you what he's going to do to the devil and to the false prophet and to anybody else that doesn't accept him. For everything in the book of Revelation is about one word, and that is worship. I came across something the other day in the open Bible, I think, an old Bible. And it said, what is the one word that we've got that we need to do? If we know that this is coming, we know to sing more, yes, we love that. It's to preach more, oh, we love that, some of us. Or to teach more, or to do thus and so. It said, We've got one challenge, and that is that you know what to do because knowing is believing and accepting. You don't have to beg for it. You don't have to ask for it. You don't have to get anybody to draw a picture for you. You just need to see what we do if we know that Jesus is coming. We've got to evangelize. And that means with world missions, 
That means locally. That means tell somebody about your Jesus Christ. How long has it been since you told somebody about Christ? How did it feel to have an epiphany the other day with the Lord, sir? Wasn't it great? Oh, I know it was. There are those that are waiting today, and they're waiting on you and me. How long has it been since you told somebody about Christ and really got to them now with your persuasive ability? You have a persuasive ability. You have an influence over at least one person. And that is the one person that's going to meet you at the judgment. Not the judgment of the Lamb, but the great white throne judgment. And say, you didn't tell me. You can be more persuasive than anybody on this earth. If you'll go to them and say, listen, would you just listen to me and let me show you what's going to happen? And you study it. You get the words. You get the tapes. So they get the CDs and get the notes. We'll give them to you. Listen, so that you can learn it. And you can learn it by the way it happens. And not have to guess. Now, I want to show you about heaven. I want to show you the turnaround. I want your family here. I want my family here. I want your friends here. I want them here. You say, why? I want them here because I don't want them to be lost. That's it. I know that's not the way a theologian is supposed to say it. That's it, but that is it. How about standing up with me, would you? Now, I'm going to ask the ushers right now to come down. And I'm going to ask you to take this offering. We'll know what it is tomorrow or next week. I'll let you know how much comes in, okay? I want us to sing a song about the end time. It's old, but you know it. It's, he's coming soon. With joy, we welcome his return. I want the singers to come out. Let the singers come out and, and sing with me. Will you all come out with your, come out and sing with them. You know the song, you know the song. Come on out and sing. He's coming soon. Now let them move among you and give your offerings for the go offering. Come on. Good. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. With joy. and every eye open. By the way, when Jesus comes, you don't think you're going through the air with your eyes closed, do you? <laughs> you're talking about a deer in the headlight. Wide open all the time. Pastor, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I believe that in my heart that he's coming back, that he's my savior. I'm gonna see your hand. If you can't do it, you've got a problem, okay? And we're gonna pray about it right now. You can put them down. Because I want to know if you've got some doubts about whether you're ready or not, I wanna see your hand go up and say, pray for me, pastor, all over the house. How many? I got some doubts. And we are gonna have a big time when we get to heaven, praise God, glory. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Glory, hallelujah.
Glory to God. Let's sing it again and then greet somebody. Would you do that? Greet somebody and remember, bring your lawn chairs next Sunday, 10 o'clock. Be there with bells on. God bless y'all.